Welcome back to the sweatshop boys and girls. Today we are working on a 2001 Subaru Outback. Here's a look at all the stuff we're going to be changing. We have a CV shaft, two seals, a bearing, pads, two coated rotors, and a hub. Before we get started with today's video, do me a favor and smash that subscribe button. All of those parts except the other rotor and set of pads are going on this side of the vehicle, passenger front side of the vehicle. Why? Because at some point in this vehicle's life there has been an impact. You can see there that the door doesn't line up and it's actually much higher than the rear door. Over here in the front, the fender as well as the door don't line up quite exactly as how they should. And on this side here, quite a few parts were changed by a Subaru dealer. Now here's a little bit of background. We did change out the two front rotors originally. What was wrong with the rotors were this side here was heavily warped. The other side was fine within spec. The other thing with this side is the CV shaft has no play back and forth. You should be able to go back and forth with the CV shaft. Now a lot of parts were changed on this side including the spindle, the caliper, the shocks, the lower control arm, bearing and hub. So it was not really something that I was thinking that would be warped. Just for reference here's the other side of the vehicle. You can see it looks like this side has spent its entire life in Canada while this side has spent its entire life in Florida or California. So as I was saying it was a shock to me that the hub itself was bent and that is exactly what was causing the rotor to warp. What's happening is because the hub is bent the rotor is constantly touching the pad ever so slightly causing it to heat up and then of course warp over time. So of course we're going to be changing all these parts out in an effort to try and remedy the issues that we're having which I don't think I mentioned so I'll go ahead and mention them now. Essentially we're having a bit of shimmy in the stand steering wheel when the brakes are applied. We're also having a crunching noise when the brakes are applied at certain times. It doesn't happen all the time, which leads me to believe that it's because of the warpage on this or possibly the CV shaft, which has a small leak. So we're swapping it out. Yeah. Wish me luck. First step. Let's go ahead and pull this wheel off. Now go ahead and fire this CV axle nut off. You'll need a 32 millimeter socket. Of course, uh, when something is brand new, boys and girls, uh, like a CV shaft, and you see that the nut has been staked multiple times, that's usually not a good sign. Next step, remove the caliper bolt. With your caliper bolts removed, yank the caliper off. Then take your pads out. Now get a 17 mil flex socket or wrench ratchet. Usually I use a wrench ratchet to break these guys free, an extra long one, and then go ahead and remove them all the way either by hand or with a wrench ratchet. This sort of wrench ratchet works really well. Don't touch the camera while doing the job, Jimmy. At least I'm still in frame, not for the bottom bolt. Guess I should do that all over again. Your next step, crank these two 17 millimeter bolts out. Best tool for the job is this really long flex ratcheting wrench. This one you can get with a regular socket, but this one up here, bit of a pain in the ass. You don't want to use the 3 8 because you can sometimes break your ratchet. Pull these bolts off. Yank your bracket off and your rotor. Now our next step here is to separate the bullet joint from the lower control arm. This is a crucial step because you don't want to damage your bullet joint. You need to get the proper tool. The proper tool is this guy here. There are other styles of tools you can use to separate the bullet joint from the lower control arm. For me, this one works best on the Subarus. Don't screw this step up, otherwise you'll be replacing the bull joint. That being said, our first step in this process is gonna to be to remove the cotter pin. The nice thing about doing it on this side is that everything is basically brand new. So it should come apart nice and easily, but uh, you know, being a mechanic, whatever you think is gonna happen usually doesn't happen. And whatever bad can happen will happen. So. Wish me luck, boys and girls. Then get a 19 mil and hammer that off. With a flat screwdriver or a small clip remover, what you wanna do is just raise the boot up just a bit so you can sneak this in without damaging the boot. That looks higher than the normal one, damn it. This may be a pain in the ass. 
Knowing my fucking luck. Oh, dude, yeah, that's not gonna work. So it looks like Subaru made some modifications to their new lower control arms that they, or the lower control arm that they put on this thing because it's slightly too big and I can't fit my tool over. So we're gonna use a tie rod and puller to assist us in this. Hopefully this works. If not, we're gonna have to do it the old fashioned way and beat it like it owes us money. Of course, I don't like doing that. It's just not good on your joints or the joints of the car. But... Very important step that a lot of people who follow this method usually miss. Put the boot back in. So what you'll need to do is get a little hook, non-pointed hook, pull the boot back over the joint. Now we've got to separate the lower control arm all the way from the bull joint. What we want to do is push on the CV, make sure it's loose, which this one is. It feels so good today. It's like working on a, on a Florida car. Get a really big pry bar. Stick the pry bar in between the subframe here and on the front of the control arm right there where the stabilizer link is. Pry down and then just move the bowl joint out. Be very careful because if for whatever reason it slips and your fingers in there, that's the end of your work day and possible work week. So be very careful. With the separated, pull your pry bar out. In case you're wondering the tools that I use to get the boot back down, it's this little guy here. Basically, it is a non-pointed edge and it's not sharp. So it's not gonna puncture the boot and cause this thing to prematurely fail. Make sure that, well, if your joint's newer like mine is, you may have some grease come out. What you can do is squeeze the joint like this the actual boot you'll have a little bit of a pocket here where you can push the grease back in or put some new grease in and if you have an oil joint you can stuff some new grease in there it'll help it last longer just put the right type of grease in so what ended up happening the second time around and why I did the run out test on this side is because we had a rotor that I know to be good these rotors generally when I put them on I haven't had issues with them in the past of course you can get issues with all sorts of stuff but but because we had it on the same side again, I did a run out test. That's where you hook up a dial indicator anywhere on the spindle and basically you do a run out test and usually within one to two thou is acceptable tolerance. That's what I was taught. But this thing, <laughs> this thing was bouncing around like at least a millimeter, millimeter and a half. So that, I don't know how they managed to screw this up. I don't think it was hit or damaged after the fact. Definitely not by the new owner. So I don't know what the situation is there. Kind of awkward to me but we're going to change this guy out and hope that that solves uh, all of our warpage issues in this area which should solve the rotor warping from excessive heat on the one side as well as this crunching or crunking noise that he has whenever he applies the brakes enough rambling about that our next step now is to get this off now there are a few different ways you can do this you can do this with a slide hammer which is a pain in the ass i have what's called an otc hub grappler which i absolutely love by the way otc uh i am still open for sponsorship uh just uh holla at your boy you know what i mean <laughs> What we're going to do is use our hub grappler to pull this guy off. Uh, because this one is nice and new, we will also be pulling the shield off. So get a 12 millimeter and yank this guy out of the way. Get a 12 mil and hammer these three bolts off. Then pull your shield off. God, that's so nice. Like, look how easy that come off. Oh. Why couldn't all the cars be like this? I actually enjoy doing these sorts of jobs. I mean, you can see here that rust type is starting to become a pain in the rear end uh, over here. So we'll remedy that with a bit of anti-seize. With the shield out of the way, what we're gonna do is grab a hold of the hub and yank the CV shaft all the way out. Now, if for whatever reason you are not replacing your seals or bearing, when you do yank your CV out, be very careful if you're just replacing the CV shaft because you do not want to hit the dust shield or the seal itself and damage that dust barrier. Your bearing will fail premature. Look at this, boys and girls. It's bent so bad you can actually see it while rotating it. I'm not sure if you'll see it on camera, but I can see it. That's pretty bad. Now here's the setup that I'm going with with my OTC hub grappler. I absolutely love this tool. The reason being is because it will save you money over time after the initial purchase. Of course, you're gonna have to do about 1,700 jobs because it is quite expensive. Not quite 1,700, but I'd say at least 
I'd say at least seven to 10, depending upon what you charge and all that stuff. Main saving point, you don't have to pull the whole spindle off in order to press out the bearing. A lot of times, and this is probably how this hub got damaged, is when you have to press it in, if you don't do it exactly right and put equal amounts of pressure, you can really screw things up. I'm not saying that's how this one was done, but most likely. The other big positive to doing a bearing with this type of tool is that you don't have to touch your strut, which generally will affect your alignment. So you can save the customer time there as well as yourself some time. Now, here's the setup that we've gone with. In the back there, there's just a little dowel and then your nut. What we do and how we put it on is we thread it all up by hand first and then you go ahead and you can hit it with your gun it's a one inch socket on this side i don't know what size the other piece is the nut there we just use an adjustable and then hit it it's also therapeutic another big thing make sure that you are clear all around on the hub you don't want to damage this bolt because if you damage it otc will not provide you any warranty coverage get your favorite adjustable your favorite one inch and gun and hammer I know, can it be that easy? That's what you're saying, right? It can be that easy, boys and girls. Now you can also see why we have no choice but to replace the bearing as well as the seals. Obviously the seal is probably damaged from it being pulled out in such a manner. The other thing is, is that this bearing would have failed prematurely because whoever did it put grease on it. You're not supposed to put grease on these bearings. They're already lubricated from the factory. So the more I dig, the worse it looks for the technician who actually did this job. Now, if you have a ball type bearing, because some of these do get replaced with those aftermarket bearings that are ball type, your seal will come off. Don't mix them up because there are two different seals. Pretty sure there, there is a difference in circumference. So you have to be really special sometimes times to screw them up this is all junk for us bearing and seal and hubs getting replaced as mentioned before so i don't know why i'm mentioning it again our next step here is going to be to hammer out the rear roller section of the bearing get a appropriate die and then your punch handle for your seal driving set and just tap away Essentially what's holding it is the roller bearings as well as the uh, seal. So we got to smash this son of a bitch out of the way. So I uh, accidentally did not record me smashing it out. But once you smash it out, it'll fall all over the floor and the rollers might go everywhere. And of course the grease will go everywhere. So clean up the grease and then I'll show you the wonderful part about Subaru. If it's on this fucking side because it obviously wasn't here. So Now I'm not 100% sure as to who actually did this job or what the situation was but you can see it really wasn't done properly this is the seal it's really mangled that little spring keeps tension on the seal the rubber portion of the seal is fine but this won't get mangled like this in this sort of fashion from me hammering on it or from just driving this never happens it's in proper installation uh, yeah it would have failed regardless and you can see here like that that red grease is not this bearing does not come with red grease if it's a Subaru product, which I assume it was. It's usually clear grease. And anyhow, you're not supposed to put excessive grease or any grease in this cavity. It comes already pre-packed with grease. All you got to do is install it. So yeah, this was this is a real mess. So what I was saying before and what is really nice specifically about the Subaru bearing setup is the fact that they have the seals. Why? Because this snap ring here is not rotted to shit which essentially equates to you as the best possible situation or scenario you could go through because if you've ever worked on any other sort of manufacturer who has a press and bearing not only is the bearing sometimes a pain in the ass but you can waste a full day trying to get this stupid goddamn c-clip out because they just turn into one clump of rust so one of the best things by scubaru was to put in some seals makes your life as a technician so much better that's enough praise for subaru let's go ahead and remove this thing what you'll need is two small flat screwdrivers what you want to do is stick a screwdriver in here like so and then stick the other one behind like that and then just work it out like so then stick this one like this there and continue working it out 
Once you get it passed and it sort of butts up against the actual spindle, you can either do the other side or, or just keep working it loose. Now, when you get it to this point, keep your fingers close by because this guy can escape and if it flies off and hits you in the face, it's gonna suck. And that's how it's done, boys and girls. Our next step here is gonna be to identify the size of cup from our kit that will work, and then we'll take the roller section from the back here, switch it to the front, and then we'll force the remainder of the bearing out of the spindle. So this is the setup that we have gone with. You gotta be careful to make sure that you get the right adapters, because if you slip and for whatever reason you damage either the adapter, it's not gonna be warranted. And of course, if you damage your ABS sensor, you're not gonna be a happy person. On this side here, we have our roller bearing pressing on the actual piece of of the bearing that we're trying to get out then an adapter that fits pretty well without touching anything inside of here and then our through bolt of course our washers are there as well now all we got to do is do the bit with the impact wrench and adjustable wrench and hit it All right, we'll reconvene in a minute. All right, let's try that again with a super sized adjustable. All right, let me go check my compressor because I don't know why the fuck my gun doesn't have as much juice. I don't know what's on. What the fuck is going on here, bud? Okay, let's tighten this guy up again and fucking hammer it. Well, boys and girls, uh, looks like we're going to have to get our three-quarter inch gun out. Okay, so I don't know what the hell's going on here. It's really, really tight, so hopefully there's no damage to this thing. It usually isn't this tight. Usually these things come out relatively easy, so anyhow, let's convince it with this guy here. What the fuck just happened there? Did it come loose? That was quite scary there, boys and girls. Never that fucking tight. Okay, let's swap back to our half inch gun. Jeez, that was something else. Well, it's going now. There's the bearing. I really don't know why it was so tight. I've never had one that's that tight before, but uh, still got the job done. I don't see any signs of it hanging up anywhere in the bore of the spindle. I got no explanation for that one, man. Next step, get ready to install your new bearing. Yay! Now, usually, if you are in the rust belt, I'd be telling you at this point to clean up all the surface rust and whatnot inside the board. Make sure that you don't get any rust in this guy. We don't have to do that because this guy is relatively clean. So, yay. With this particular bearing, you can put it on either way. Whenever you are getting a bearing, you can see what a pain in the ass this is. Obviously, I've got a good bearing. This one's made in Japan. It's a Koyo bearing, which which is quite a good brand name, usually an OE manufacturer. If you're looking for other ones, I'd say uh, NTN, I think it is. They're another good manufacturer that I would go with. Generally, the Japanese stuff tends to work and last the longest. Now, what you want to do is slide your bearing from this side inward like this. Oh, one other thing. That little tab there, don't take it out because it holds the rollers together, okay? There'll be a time when we take that out, you'll see. Slide the bearing in, get the appropriate adapter, put it behind, then we're gonna put our mounting cup up here and then hit it again with the one inch. Make sure you get the adapter on as evenly as possible. This one here is not necessarily important. You don't absolutely need it, but it does help me so I don't have to thread this thing in the back there on for about a half an hour. I just gotta get it on there a bit. Now, adjustable and hammer. 
Oh, fuck you. That's exactly what you don't want to happen. You can prevent that by tightening it up by hand. Make sure that you get a visual on the back to make sure it's centered as possible and then you can go ahead and hammer it. Back it out some more. And that's that, boys and girls. You have a bearing that is installed. Our next step is to switch to the other side and install the snap ring. Get a snap ring pliers. Your snap ring, what you're gonna do is place it in the hole like this. Hold the bottom of the snap ring in place and then try to get this thing to cooperate with you. Uh, they're a pain in the ass, be careful. Whatever you do, don't get hit by them. You can also set the plier up with the ring off the car. Sometimes that makes it a bit easier, like as in now. And then snap it home. Get your flat screwdriver and verify that it is in the groove on either side. And there you go. Okay, boys and girls, we are ready to install our seals. Another thing that was installed wrong on this vehicle, they put the seal that looks like this on the outside here, and they put this one on the inside. It's actually supposed to go the opposite way around. This guy is the inner seal with that little lip there, and this one is the outer seal. Also, be careful. You don't want to screw them up because they are different circumferences. What we want to do is just kind of force that in there. It's a little bit too loose, so we'll put uh, some goop on it to keep it nice nice and still in there. I don't know if they ground this down or what the hell they did, but somehow they managed to screw up a lot of the shit that they should have not screwed up. Now we have installed our rear seal because it has an actual friction fit. This one is quite loose. So what I've done is put some goop on it. The goop is this form of gasket stuff that I've used on many types of vehicles before. Don't put too much on and then wipe off the excess this is going to hold the seal in place. It's that stuff there. It is what it is. Now, with the seal in place, you can go ahead and push this black tube here out. For whatever reason, this one was extremely hard to get out. After you get your seals in, force this thing out by hand. What you want to do if it's extremely hard like mine was is support the bearing. Be sure not to have dirty gloves because you don't want all sorts of dirt getting into the bearing. Now you can go ahead and put your hub in. With your brand new hub or your old hub, what you want to do is make sure that the surface is clean of rust. Clean it up. Make sure you don't have excessive grease or oil on it. And then you can go ahead and place it into the hub. When you place it into the hub, be sure to line it up as straight as possible and then get your tool and you can drive it on. So the setup that we have here is basically the through bolt, through the bearing of course, and then a die that is smaller than the actual seal. The nice thing is it barely touches the seal so it'll keep any kind of dirt and crud out. And then on this side we have another die that protrudes a little bit farther out. You can use a smaller die or this uh, with the really small die inside the circumference of the hub here. But we need the length so that the shaft or the through bolt doesn't bottom out. Now all it's left to do is fire it home. seal what you can do is rotate it just to make sure it's seated nicely and then fire it the rest of the way home when you hear that change you've bottomed out now all you got to do is remove it and then check it to make sure that you installed it correctly you'll know it's installed correctly because you won't have any binding and this thing will run true test it with the dial indicator if you had the same issue that i did go ahead and put your brake shield back on don't forget to grind up those holes if yours has rust like mine did and to seize the bolts and go ahead and torque them to 13 foot pounds always thread them in by hand first because obviously you don't want to screw it up my next step is going to be to take this cv shaft off you can see there right where my index finger tip is there is a dowel pin that you need to smash out with a punch i think i use a quarter inch punch to smash that guy out or something a little bit smaller unfortunately uh, the camera is in my swinging range so you won't be able to see me doing it in case you're wondering, it is a 730 seconds bit. What I usually do is I use an extension like this with a socket to get to that dowel. Unfortunately, my camera did not record when I asked it to. 
so I didn't get the footage of me taking the CV shaft out. Essentially, what you want to do is just wiggle it out nice and gently once you smash the pin out. Once you get the pin out, you can go ahead, put your new shaft in. Be sure to line the shaft up properly so that you can hammer this new guy back home. You'll see with the new one and the old one, there should be a tapered edge like this. Obviously start with this edge, just get a punch that is bigger than the hole of the CV shaft so that you don't smash this through. Install this. And for those of you who wonder how I install it, basically I have a piece of tool steel that I drilled a quarter inch hole in and I just slide that guy in there to start it, smash it home a couple of times and then get a punch and drive it home the rest of the way. Now you can go ahead and install the other end of the CV shaft. Be sure to not hit your brand new seals and line this up as carefully as possible also before you put it in there make sure you put a nice layer of anti-seize so that in case you ever have to do this job again it won't be such a pain a little bit of white lithium grease does the trick now get your really big pry bar and prepare for war with your really big pry bar pry down on the lower control arm pray to god there is no family history of aneurysms and work the spindle into place or the bowl joint oh jesus Oh, there we go. Also, uh, employ the use of a bungee cord so that your caliper doesn't fall off like mine just did. Not necessarily the worst thing in the world, but not the best either, boys and girls. Now, just slide your shaft all the way home. Twist it a bit to make sure it's not bound up on the seal. Put your CV nut on. Now we can get to our brakes. Tighten up your CV nut just a bit. We're gonna torque it afterwards properly. Now, let's torque our bolt joint. Run this up and then tighten it down to 30 foot pounds. Would help to turn the torque wrench on first, boys and girls. Once you get it to 30, what you wanna do is keep cranking on it until you can pass a cotter pin through the bolt joint hole, or the hole in the bolt joint, whoopsies. Okay, put a brand new cotter pin in there. Brand new cotter pin. Don't forget to bend it so it doesn't come out. Before you put your rotor on, make sure you coat this with some anti-seize or some white lithium grease. Remember, for proper application, shake well. Nice healthy dose never hurt nobody. Slap the rotor on. Now what you got to do is prep your caliper bracket to receive those new pads if you're replacing all this stuff. If not, just give it a fresh layer of grease and put it all back together. I'm not going to show you how to do that. I've done that in my other videos. Basically the same process. Healthy coating of grease, any rust, grind it off, get it away, and you're good to go. Go ahead and lubricate your pad carrier. Put on the new hardware if you're replacing your pads and lubricate the sliders again just at the boot. I find that to be really important. Stick as much lubricant right up in here. That way you don't have any rust forming. Where the rust forms up here, it'll work its way into the bore and make your life a pain in the ass. You can also, on most Subarus, put the pads like this in the carrier without them falling apart just because these hardwares are brand new, so they usually keep them there. And slide it into place, get your 17 mil, make sure you anti-seize the hell out of these uh, things and throw them in. Try your best not to get any grease on the rotor while installing it. Thread the bolts up by hand and drive them home with a wrench ratchet or well, I usually use the wrench ratchet for both because uh, I don't know if I explained it yesterday, but uh, basically it's a pain in the ass to uh, fit a socket up on the top bolt because the shock bolt's there. Uh, you can use a socket for this guy or power driver, but you know, whatever. Torque spec for the bracket is 58 foot pounds. I usually just torque it to 60. You can see that bolt's a pain in the ass. And there you go, boys and girls, you're good to go. Now you can place your caliper back in place. Now, boys and girls, here is a tip that'll really help you. If you have cars that come into your shop that a customer has complained about vibrations and whatnot, essentially what you can do, there's, there's two bonuses to doing this. You can apply a little bit of silicone just on the edge of the piston, on either piston, as well as the back hair of the caliper. What that'll do is it will lessen the chance of the backing of the pad sort of escaping in this bracket here for the caliper and make an all 
all sorts of squealing noise and vibrations that'll drive you and the customer goddamn insane. Uh, vibration is my version of vibrations. It's a pain in the ass sometimes. It'll just it'll give you all sorts of squeaks and annoying shit that you can't get rid of, and it'll just make you want to jab a screwdriver through your eye. Now. Don't gob it on. You don't want to get it all over the rubbers. The second thing to having the silicone on there is the silicone is basically a barrier between oxygen and bare metal. So you won't have all sorts of rust in the bore, which can sometimes, which I've seen rust to the point where (laughs) the bore itself or the piston actually leaks. That's the fun of being in the rust belt here in Canada, Ontario. Now, those are the bonuses so it's up to you a lot of people are like no no you just put grease what i find with grease or anti-seize or any of that sort of stuff i don't recommend putting it on the back of your pad because it melts off it washes off and i don't know why anybody would want to do that but i've had a few people say to me that this is a good thing to do i don't agree i would choose silicone over anti-seize or grease should look something kind of like that nothing too aggressive that there is some anti-seize you can leave that alone if you have anti-seize like that but not too much silicone and then place your caliper on the bracket i should have had that in a frame with your caliper in place make sure your line is in its normal stress-free position the brake line that is put your bolts in thread them in by hand and then torque them to 29 foot pounds i think it was Uh, i usually do these ones between 20 and 30 depending on whatever the recommendation is like four to five seconds of this clip is going to be used it's 45 seconds wonderful well boys and girls the time has come now for us to torque our axle nut it is 159 pounds that are required to torque this to spec now I don't have any friends with me today, so I have no one to depress the brake for me. What I am going to do is show you a trick that I usually do on vented rotors. Take a punch, stick it into any selected vent, and then start cranking, man. Now, with press fit bearings and hub assemblies or anything where a CV shaft and bearing run through, you want to be close to the torque spec. You don't want to go over because you can prematurely damage the bearing. And if it's under, you'll have it literally come apart. So be careful and torque it to the right spec. Don't forget to get a punch and stake the nut. This is an awkward position. Yay! Before you put your wheel on, Blast it with some more grease. And of course, shake well. Yeah, get all that grease. After you coat it with white lithium grease, go ahead and put your wheel on. Now, before you go for a test drive, if you have touched your braking system, this is something I forgot to mention in my brake video, which I should have, which is pointed out by one of my number one fans, Mr. Colbert. Pump your brakes, because if you don't pump them, it's an accident waiting to happen. Pump it in park. You can pump them with the vehicle off and the pedal will get hard if you you want to you can start the vehicle and pump it just make sure that your brakes are engaging okay enough said fire these bolts home make sure you turn them on by hand torque him to spec i believe the recommended was 58 to 72 i torque all my subarus to 100 never had an issue not going to change boys and girls that is that for the outback we are good to go the next thing on the agenda for us is to go ahead test drive this vehicle make sure it is all good don't forget to pump your brakes before you go on that test drive most importantly subscribe like share and most importantly subscribe As always, thanks for watching. We will see you in the next one. Because at some point on this vehicle, then take your cat. (sighs) Fuck you, Subaru. Um, By the way, OTC, I am still open for ownership. What? You don't have to pull the spindle off and the whole hub assembly. What? You don't have to pull the whole spindle. Spindle? Oh, God. OTC will not warrant it. Now you can also see why we are. Oh, look at that. One of the absolute most wonderful things about Subaru is on their front and rear bearings. The snap ring that holds their bearing in place is not on this side. What the fuck is going on here, bro? Force the. Ugh. Oh, you fucking pile of shit. Oh, damn you, wrench. Still in frame, baby. Yeah. But after you get your seals out, or you...
God damn it. And make sure you take your time, thread the hat, <laughs> thread the hat. Now boys and girl, here is a boys and girl. Well, my analytics said that, but whatever. Push the rim onto the tire and hit it. Oh fuck. That's 15 fucking seconds. Stupid Jimmy. I oh, really should have set the fucking torque wrench before I started recording because we're low on data. Don't forget to sis. <laughs> what?